Thank you all for being here. Uh, you know, getting to talk about time lapse is just one of my favorite things. I don't know, I'm just going to ask you if you don't, show, don't mind a show of hands, how many of you are actually creating time lapses right now? Okay, well, I hope to supercharge you. Uh, one of the great things I think about time lapse, you know, cameras today, we have three different options in how we want to capture imagery. And initially, it's a still capture. We all kind of probably grew up as still photographers, grab something that looks beautiful and keep moving. Periodically now, especially with the HDSLR, we get to shoot video. Now, a lot of people don't want to become videographers. Why, why shoot video? But I don't see that everything really fits in the still frame anymore. And since I can't tell you when, probably the beginning of the 80s, I saw a movie called Kiana Squatsky. And uh, just changed my life. I couldn't wait to get to beyond 36 frames or 12 medium format frames where I could capture motion. And realistically, it tells more of a story. You know, it, con it condenses time, and we're able to kind of just relate what we see. And I've got a few different examples to show you, but what I thought I'd start off with uh, is the idea of what is time lapse. We've got kind of some rules and some guidance into what goes into this, kind of to make your life easy. And then from there, it kind of becomes the creative element. So ultimately, I want to thank Canon. This is a big part of uh, what I'm able to do because of the equipment that I can use there and, of course, the magnificent cameras that they create for me to, to create this work on. So this is something I just created uh, on the 5D Mark IV. This, I, was early, I was able to get an early release model, got to capture a number of images for them. This is actually an in-camera time lapse. In camera in the 5D Mark IV, no intervalometer, no post-processing. So I was out one night in the uh, Arizona desert, had the Milky Way, got there, uh, picked out a foreground, and we're going to talk about all these elements that I think make a strong uh, time lapse. But what I wanted to do there was just simply set it inside the camera, walk away from it. And one of the things I do when I create time lapses, I'm often out with a handful of tripods, which means a handful of cameras, that we're not limited to one situation. That 10 second clip that you just saw took about 45 minutes or an hour to capture. And I'm doing a two second interval in between each frame. And in this case, I believe it was a 30 second exposure each frame. So we'll, we'll deal with ISO, we'll deal with all the information that goes into what makes a strong time lapse. I thought I'd show you that one as kind of an opener. And then the next one, which to me is kind of fun, you know, going out and finding things that are fun to photograph. And there's always a little camouflage somewhere. I, I chose this funnel cakes in front of this Ferris wheel because it was a big, bright LED screen. And that would have blown out and really created a lot of problems in post-production, so I just found something to go in front of it. But it's a lot of fun to just see movement back and forth. You know, and realistically, what time-lapse is, you know, we're condensing time into a very short period but more than that, it, it starts off as a strong still photograph. And I don't think anything changes from that. We're used to composing, we're used to exposing, and I bring that together in, in doing time lapse that it, it's gotta be a strong image. If it's not, you know, we're looking at it for 10 seconds, sometimes up to a minute. And we don't really wanna go too long because then we have to start getting it to B-roll, right, a second angle to create some interest or to maintain interest. Because I think viewers get tired really quickly of seeing the same thing. And to me, that's what makes a good, strong, still photograph, is that you can, you can look into it and see layers, so you want to stay there a little bit longer. But let me go into and give you a little bit of guidance into what I feel time-lapse is, what it takes to make time-lapse. And then I've got a plethora of examples, different lighting conditions, different ideas for you, and the more involved you'll get into it, well, we're going to end up talking about motion control. So it's not all about just sticking a camera on a tripod and leaving it there. But you have to cut your teeth, right? It's like anything that you learn, you'll get used to it as you go, and then you'll, you'll grow more and more. So multiple frames over a period of time to compress time. I'm going to remind you there'll be certain things I'll be repeating for you as we go through and later we'll discuss questions if uh, any exist. But one of the things that's, that's important now, because we're gonna have change. If we're dealing with a period of time, I, I need to work in manual exposure mode. I and mean, some people work in that all the time anyway. I tend to work in aperture value for my still photographs. 
a, a dominant part of the time, but there's always a reason to go into another mode. You know, if I'm photographing motion, I go into t uh, time value or shutter speed, or in this case, or when I'm working with flash, I'm in manual control, manual exposure, because I don't want anything to change throughout that time. Light's gonna change, and if light changes, we don't want the camera to flicker. Right? We don't wanna see the difference where the camera compensates for exposure. So that's usually the first mistake that some people make is just leaving everything on auto. And here we're gonna shut everything down. I don't work with anything like auto white balance for time lapse. Again, it changes from frame to frame, and you're gonna see a color difference. So I wanna use either the correct preset or a custom white balance whatever the situation. I tend to work a lot in the custom white balances. Right, it's a beautiful sunny day out in New York City right now. I'd be working in sunny mode. And all the way through. In here, if we had fluorescent lights, I'd be dealing under fluorescent balance. And the one thing that is never far from me is an intervalometer. In this case, for the, the bodies that I photograph with, I'm using the Canon TC80N3. It's a three-point connection that goes into your port on the side of the camera, and the, an intervalometer is a four-function unit that will control, if needed, a self-timer, a long exposure, if we want to go beyond the 30-second exposure that the camera provides us, the interval in between which it'll continue taking photographs, and the last part is the number of frames that it'll capture. So I'm going to work backward now. The number of frames that it's going to capture, I just leave it at, at two lines or zero, which is an infinite number. The intervalometer the Canon provides can only go up to 99 frames, and I'm usually making images beyond 300 frames. And just to give you the idea, 300 frames at 30 frames per second translates into a 10-second time lapse. So you're really dealing with the number of images based upon how long you want that clip to be. You can adjust things in post-processing where we can shorten that 10 seconds, we can speed it up a little bit, or if we need to stretch it out, we can adjust things there. And then cards. You know, it's kind of important. You want to have all the information there, so you probably wouldn't want to start with a two or a four gigabyte card. So I'm working in the either 32 or 64 gigabyte cards. I tend to, when I'm out making time lapses specifically. You know, time lapse to me is a, a part of what I'm doing when I'm out, so I may be shooting stills up to a certain point, or video or something else. If I, I want to be conscious of how much memory is left on my card. Worst thing in the world is you've got a beautiful sunset going on or a storm happening in front of you and all of a sudden you run out of room. So a great method is to kind of replace the card just before you begin. You also, I want to do everything in RAW. Nothing changes for that for me. Uh, I capture every image, everything I can in the absolute finest quality so that we can make the best rep reproduction that we can all the way through. In this case, we'll be processing the images and we'll talk about post-production a little bit later. The other thing that's really important is manual focus. The worst thing in the world, it sees something and it's searching for focus or it just keeps moving, which changes your image size. And when it changes your image size, the viewer is going to go crazy looking at it. So you'll cut your teeth. You're going to make a few of these mistakes, hopefully by taking notes and seeing uh, the, the help that I'm providing you here, you can benefit from that and not have to make those mistakes. But a few more things that I find really important, and I know this, this just cracks me up as I'm walking around the city here or wherever I'm photographing, the lens hood that comes with your camera. You know, when they package it, it reverses so it can fit into your case. When we take it out of the case and mount it on a camera, I find it really important to turn it around. And it's supposed to be used to block the light. And you'll see, if you haven't seen this or paid attention to it, it's a funny kind of thing. I just, I'd love to go up to people and ask them to turn it around, or some people don't even bother carrying it with them. I, I just like it as well. It's, it's a pain in the neck, but you know what? Flare is a bigger pain in the neck. Right? We're trying to eliminate flare. We're trying to keep the integrity of the contrast with the lens. You know, we're investing good money into Canon lenses. We want to make sure that we've got all of it there. Batteries. Kind of a, a simple, simple thought here. Make sure your batteries are full. You know, the nice thing about time lapse 
is that you have no idea what is going to happen in 10 minutes or an hour. So you want to make sure that you don't cut yourself short. The same way a card can eliminate your, your continuation of your time lapse, batteries put a quick end to that. And to me, the biggest part is once I get the camera on the tripod, I don't want to touch the tripod. Right? I don't want to kick it. It's an earthquake. Everything is going to just throw, it'll, it'll move it off. It's no longer straight. There's so many different things. But sometimes we have to really be conscious of what we're doing in our space. And I can kind of segue that into situational awareness. You know, one of the important things as a photographer, as a visual artist, know what's going on around you at all times, right? Know what your situation is. You're locked into doing a time lapse. You don't want anybody building up behind you. They may want to see if they can take your camera home with them, and we don't like that. But more often, there's often something going on elsewhere. So when you've committed time and committed this exposure, I want to be moving on to something else because I can multitask. I can have this one started, the next one going, and all of a sudden we've got room for that B-roll so we can put these together. You know, when you're doing long capture or doing overnight exposures, we're primarily going to talk about nighttime time lapse, but I've, I've built in a number of different ideas for you to share with you today. When I'm doing long exposures overnight, let's just say I'm photographing the Milky Way going across the sky and that's going to take two and a half hours at 30 second exposures. Well, then I need to make sure that I have plenty of battery for that. There's so many supplemental batteries right now that we can plug in the AC adapter rather than just having those onboard batteries. And that way we can go to a supplemental battery where it's going to power it for a week. And this way we don't have to concern ourselves with running out of power. But boy, the steadiness is really important. Once I touch the camera, once I get it set, I focus it manually. I tape down the focus so that's not going to move. If it's a zoom lens, depending upon the lens, I'll probably tape down that portion of it as well. It's not apt to move, but I like to just cover myself. And then the best part is nobody goes near the tripod. You especially, you're aware of it, but people are always, what's going on there? Can I look through it? No. You know, they accidentally kick and say, I'm sorry, and they walk off. I'm sorry means you go back to the drawing board if you can. You might be an hour or two into it, and now you have to begin again. You know, the other part that we deal with in just the past couple of days here in New York, it's been pretty windy. So my tripod, it's a really right stuff tripod, nice anchor at the bottom. Either my case will hang from there. I carry empty sandbags so that I can fill it up wherever I am and make sure that it's weighted down because, God forbid, it's really a breezy day and the thing just moves a little bit. You're not going to want to see that in there, and you can't just extract it, because with it being a smooth sequence of images, when you take something out, it's kind of a jump. So we kind of have to think of all these things beforehand. And with that, you're trying to predict the future. You know, when I set something up, I'm taking into consideration, where's the sun going to travel to? Or in this case, it might be evening, so Where's the moon going to be? We know it's going to transit the sky from east to west. So how will that impact my subject? I always want to light the subject the best that I can, and that's often a big part of where and why I begin. When I put that tripod down and pick out a spot, you know, it's an alignment of so many different things, but often a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. Taking that all into consideration, that movement is going to become part of my decision making. And the way I've noted here, I start with the end in mind. I want to know where I'm going to end up, if that's going to be the strong part, and especially if we're in motion control. If we have something that's providing us some movement, you can't just begin it blindly. We don't just have a six-foot slider inside a tree and say, OK, well, I'll start it here, and it'll move to here, but I may have no picture when it gets here. So there's some setting up situations that we'll talk about when I show you what I'm talking about here. But I have to factor so much time into this. It's not just simply that 125th of a second that we're considering ourselves you know, doing as a still photographer, and then you move on. Now, shutter speed becomes important, and especially if we're, we're working at night. Do we want to show motion, or do we want to see things kind of frozen? So we may have to go up into a very high ISO in order to accomplish that. 
but there are times that motion is great if it's water, even people moving in front of you. But there'll be certain things that you want to keep frozen. So you just have to, again, make these decisions before you actually begin the time lapse so that what you're doing at the beginning is what will come through at the end as well. And I, I consider this the same way when I take regular still photographs, starting with the end in mind. I never kind of lose sight of that. Right? It's, it's even how will I finish this it may impact how I take the photograph. Now, the intervalometer or the interval will be dependent upon the movement in the frame. There are those days where if you've looked up at clouds, and you may not study clouds yet, but if you're, an inter if you're a time-lapse fan, you're going to be really conscious of clouds moving. What direction are they moving? How quickly are they moving? You know, still photographer, oh, pretty clouds, good shot. Right? Landscape, photograph, everything is done. But now we're considering where do we want to stand in relation to those clouds going by, or is it one of those days where the clouds are barely moving, we can barely perceive that there's any movement at all? Or the days like today where the, you can watch the cloud move across the sky? Well, that's going to help us pick an interval. I normally work with a two-second interval. It's a pretty normal time, so when you see the pace of everything I'm going to share with you in a few minutes, it moves comfortably. If it's something that's going by very, very quickly, I'm probably going to go to a one-second interval because I want to have more frames in there so when it plays back, I can slow it down. Conversely, if it's one of those slow days where that cloud is just slowly drifting across the sky, I might do a five-second interval so I can kind of speed it up. Right? If there's more time in there, the movement will be more apparent. So you're in control. Right? You're in the driver's seat, and that's what's fun about time lapse. You know, it's, it's our own vision. What do we want to do? It's cr absolute creative license. So I may vary seriously between tw two seconds and 20 seconds in interval. It's not unusual. But now, this seems to be the most difficult part. Time lapse needs to have an element in your composition that's moving. I've, I've done many workshops, and I often bring people to a, a state fair or a county fair. Right? There are rides moving, there's a lot of things. And I'll set them out to do something. We'll talk about what we're going to do and set them off. And the next day, they come in with their finished time lapse, and they've picked something that is not moving, and there's nothing moving in the frame. Now you've got 300, 400 images of nothing moving. So it's, it's kind of pointless. So we, we all make, you know, we all make, uh, we all have problems when we're learning something. We can't really see the finished product, but I think we have to understand the theory to begin with. That to me is the most important. So clouds, cars, boats, waves, people walking, light and shadows moving, a clock turning you really start to examine what does movement mean? You know, how am I going to incorporate that? You may not have any clouds in the sky, beautiful blue sky, no wind. What are you counting on moving? So you'll find it. It might just be time itself because as that sun transitions and you see a shadow walk right across the floor or walk up a wall. I was in Monument Valley a couple of weeks ago. I was out doing a couple of different national parks and Monument Valley in, in the, on the Arizona-Utah border has my, I guess, favorite buttes or monuments. It's called Left and Right Mitten. The rocks have eroded to look like two hands. And two days a year, the shadow from Left Mitten crawls up on Right Mitten. So wow, I timed it great that I was going to be in the neighborhood, so I went over. and. It's just so magnificent to see this thing happen because most people don't see. You know, we look, but we don't see. And here it is, nothing moving in the sky, and all of a sudden this shadow appears out of nowhere and climbs right up the rock, and bam, it's sitting. So you have just that shadow to tell that story of time. Now, because you have such a major investment in time, you want to make sure that everything's going to be working for you, so you, gotta, you need to do a little test. So first thing, you want to focus, recheck focus, get in, use your LCD, make sure that you go to 100%, and make sure that what you need to have 
sharp is sharp. Right? We're going to make sure that the framing is correct, the exposure is correct, and there'll be a number of times I'm going to work with graduated neutral density filters if I'm doing landscapes. So I want to bring the sky exposure down a little bit. There's a difference between the sky and the earth. But if I can base my exposure on the sky, which is going to be constant or consistent, whatever happens down here when the cloud goes in front of the sun and the building goes into shadow, no big deal because we understand shadow. And if we've kept a good exposure, then by all means we have great exposure in the shadows, great exposure in the highlights, so when it goes back and forth, it's certainly easy to digest visually. And that's what we're looking at. It's going to look as normal to the viewer as possible. So, 90 minutes isn't, a, isn't a, a strange time to commit to something like this. So once I finish my tests, I'll often then wipe the card, make sure that I've got fresh batteries, make sure my exposure is set, make sure I'm on the right settings, make sure I've got enough ISO for later, whatever it might be. I want to make sure before I hit start on the intervalometer, I'm all good to go. Now. Canon has made it easy for us because we've got this either built-in intervalometer in the camera or even just built-in in-camera time-lapse. But it's there for convenience. You know, if you're cutting just little scenes, you don't want to necessarily have to do a lot of post-production, have all these raw frames, get in, process them, crop them, and then output them. You can go directly right to film, and that's kind of what the idea of the built-in built time-lapse is inside cameras today. Excuse my sniffling once in a while. Um, in doing that, everything's going to go for what you set it at the beginning. So if I've set a 10 second, 300 exposure time lapse in the camera, I can't change it anymore. It's going to exhaust at that point. I can't extend it. So I'm really a fan of using the hanging intervalometer. At any point when I'm unsure of the light, I can stop it because it has a start stop button on it. I can stop it, see the review on the back of the camera, make a quick analyzation. I can manually continue my two second interval, kind of get on a beat, even though it's not automatically being done. But I can review and make determinations of what I want to do or if I do need to stop it or even adjust exposure during the middle of it. Let's just say some big clouds come over and it changes your exposure, three, four F stops. We want to know that when it's time. So that gives me all the freedom and flexibility. And as I mentioned earlier in, in the discussion, when that hanging intervalometer is, is just on run, if I decide that I want it to do it for a 300 exposure count, but yet everything's happening really great in front of me, I can go to 3,000 exposure count without changing anything. Right? You're prepared in case of. And I think that's what's important to all of us as photographers, being prepared for what you haven't figured out. So once we get into the idea of processing, this kind of scares some people. There are some things that I can share with you that make your life really, really easy. But the first and, and most important one is I make a folder for every time lapse. I work in Lightroom, so I want to know that if I'm going to build a B&H time lapse, I just have to go to the B&H folder. I don't have to go through my entire library to find that. It makes things very, very easy to find after the fact. So, as we discussed, there could be 300 to 5,000 images in there. We talked about the idea of a 30 to 1 ratio. You need 30 images or frames to be captured to translate to one second of video. Now, when we get into finally looking at some examples, you're going to see that this all flows so smoothly. And that's the idea of it. If you've seen things before, other people creating time lapses that are kind of jittery and they kind of stutter all the way through, they, they haven't had or created enough imagery. So we're kind of trying to stretch it to be there. So we just want to make sure that we have enough frames that we can complete the file the way we see it. And then now that you have that formula, it's kind of easy to figure out. Some people may be processing things at 24 frames per second instead of 30 frames per second for that more cinematic look. You would just use that formula then. 
you'll need 24 frames to make one second of video, or for a 10 second video, 240. And what I like to do is I rename and I renumber the files. I don't need original camera numbers there, IMG underscore 3040, but I might want to make Monument Valley underscore 0001 all the way through, or identify it even more. Left Mitten, Sensual Tree, right? There's always something to identify it, but I always want to be able to understand it rather than have to look at numbers and try to find them. So I, hopefully what I'm sharing with you is it's kind of logical. Right? You've thought it out. It makes sense to do this. You adapt it for your taste, and then we're off to the races. Now, what I want to do is, I, as I mentioned, I work in Lightroom. I want to build and work on that first file. So that first file is a regular full format frame. It's raw, so I'm going to adjust anything that I need to. I'm going to adjust my white balance. I'm going to adjust my exposure. I'm going to play with the highlights, the shadows, the contrast, everything I need, just like you would normally do in processing one of your still photographs. I'm going to do that for the first frame of just, let's say, these next 300. And I also then, once I get all my corrections made, I have to go into the crop tool. Because one of the things we need to do is we're going to bring it down to HD ratio. So 1920 by 1080. It's a little bit different. So you want to even look if you're composing through live view on your camera. When you go into video live view, that's where I would view things. I wouldn't make any exposures there, but it's going to show you by the two bars at the top and bottom of the frame what 1080p looks like. So you don't want to compose something so tight that when you get into cropping it, you've now eliminated something because it's back to the drawing board at that part at that point. You know, we may incorporate this with some other video clips and some still images, so everything's going to be consistent in that HD, HD value. So one of the things that I find most important, because it seems that most people are not that particular about cropping or straightening the camera really is the point. You know, I'll fix it later. I'm not one of those. I like to, I like to use every megapixel that Canon gives me. So with the 5D Mark IV, we're working 30.4 megapixels. I don't want to have to lose three, four, five megapixels because I have, I have to straighten it. And in the Canon brand cameras, if you hit the info button twice, there's a built-in level there. So I'm making sure of that before I ever get through and begin the processing. But now I want to make sure that I've made all of my corrections, I've cropped it, I've burned in what I have to burn in. I've dodged what I have to dodge. I want to make sure, and I, I'm going to back way up to the beginning, and forgive me for this, it's more important than ever to have a clean sensor when you're doing time lapse. There's nothing like 3,000 images with a dust spot on there. And because all the frames are moving, you can't just simply grab an area because all of a sudden you'll have a ghost image there later when it brings something in that doesn't belong there. So forgive me for sharing that out of sequence. But ultimately, keep the camera straight. I've made all my corrections. That file would be ready to print if we were going to print. In this case, now all I'm going to do is synchronize it with all the other 299 frames. Boom. It's ready to go. Everything is equal at that point. From there, my technique is I work with a, a plug-in program called LR Time Lapse. If you're serious about doing time lapse, it's a $129 program, I believe. It's the best money I've ever spent in a plug-in. It will take and crunch your raw frames to the exact size that you need. It renumbers them for their sequence. It will then take and open their program and complete the entire time lapse and spit it out for you at the end converts it into an MOV file or an MP4 file. If you choose not to invest, you're just starting off, uh, and here's the address if you want to download uh, LR time lapse. Like anything, you can try it for a couple of weeks. It's got some limitations to it, but once you use it, it's, it's a remarkable program. It makes life so easy. So if you're not into You've just tried this, you're going to see if you're really passionate about it. 
you can build things in a number of different ways, be it through QuickTime, through Adobe After Effects, or even Photoshop has a way of building this. But I've just found that Lightroom is the absolute simplest way, especially when compa uh, paired up with the LR Time Lapse program. So effectively, we talked about creating movies at 24 or 30 frames per second. That's the majority of the technical part of what you need to know. It's rather simple. It's trial and error. You're going to make a couple of mistakes as you do this. But the first thing I'd love you to do, especially it's fresh in your minds, get out there and try it right off the bat. Like anything that you learn, if nobody shared this with you, whatever seminar you sit in, whatever workshop you go to, you have to produce it by the end of the week that you're there because then it's kind of locked into your memory. But the longer that you don't try it, most you kind of forget things and before you know it, you've missed the boat. You're starting from scratch and well, it's too complicated. The one thing that I didn't put up on the screen that I thought would be just kind of common sense is we need a tripod for this. Right? We need that camera still and steady and not moving. It's, this is not a hand-holdable thing. Although on the creative side, absolutely. I've, I've done a number of handheld and running and moving with my subjects. It's got a whole different feel to it, and you want to have that feel when you're ready. But for the most part, camera locked down on a tripod. So one of the things I found important to put up, because especially for nighttime photography, nighttime exposures, photographing things where we're looking at the Milky Way, we're creating star trails, whatever we're doing in the nighttime sky, I think one of the things that baffles most people is how do you focus at infinity? You know, it's not going to the end of the lens, unfortunately. It's not the way lenses are made anymore. There's a little bit of buffer in there based upon temperature. So we have some freedom. There's still an exact spot, but until you know this, most people chase it. They go, well, I go to the end. No, that's not right. I right, go to the end and back off a little bit. You know, hand grenades and horseshoes are a little bit. For this, there's an exact place, and the exact place happens to be like what I have here. There's the focus index that's on your camera. The infinity symbol is sitting off to the right on Canon cameras, and it has this other infinity compensation mark, the L, so we just line up the vertical of the L with the vertical of the focus index that's emblazoned on our cameras, that's the point for infinity. Now, you need a headlamp for this if you're outside at night, or you need your phone, you need something to throw off a little light to do this. One of the other ways of focusing would be using live view. You can grab a street light that's far enough away, you don't want to grab something that's five or ten feet away. If there's a moon out, tonight there's still a beautiful strong moon, if you're going to make some exposures tonight, get in there, go on to live view, use your image magnification to get in there five or ten times, critically focus on the moon, take note on your lens barrel where that is, odds are it's going to align just like we see it there, but now you're critically focused. And I use electrical tape, black electrical tape, lock that down. Once I get it focused either manually or by focusing, I don't want to hit it for any reason and it move. And things do. So all those precautions kind of lead you and arm you now that we can look and talk about picking the right subject matter. You know, just those two quick ones that I showed you. I found that, that cactus, that saguaro cactus for that initial in-camera time lapse. Boom, square in the middle. Rule of thirds, it doesn't apply there. Right? It's still we learn the rules, we break the rules. Right? You want to learn them and then break them like an artist. But they still have to make sense. So I have no problem balancing things. I love symmetry. I love the idea of rules of thirds. I live that way for the most part. But periodically, I'm going to go with something right in the middle. And especially now we're going to have movement and lines. So I want to find a reason to be outside. Let's just say today, it's a nice windy day and we're all in New York City, let's all go down to uh, Battery Park and let's photograph the Statue of Liberty. We're going to take into consideration what else is there, what are the elements going on. We've got the statue and she's going to be pretty still, 
I don't think she moves much. The clouds will be whipping by. We've got a beautiful day with clouds. We'll have the ferries going out there. You know, do we want to include that or do we want to shoot long lens and just separate the Statue of Liberty and just the clouds? So we have decisions to make. So we want to compose that strongly. We talked about so we don't lose any of our resolution that we have to get in there and crop half the frame out, but ultimately just compose it like a good strong photograph. I look for foreground elements. When we're talking about nighttime, Milky Way, things like that, I need something sticking up in the sky because with the Milky Way, it can really only be seen when there's no moon. Right? So it needs to be pitch black. If we've got a full moon, you need to wait for the full moon to set before you can watch the Milky Way first appear and then dance across the sky. So when I'm in the desert, I'm always looking for a cool looking saguaro cactus. Something that's elevated, something that I can get low on so that I can put that and project it up into the sky because the sky is where I want to bring your attention. And anything below the horizon, especially at night or in this like backlit situation, anything below the horizon is pitch black. We have no detail in it. So we really need to see that outline, right? that silhouette. We could light it, but that starts to get pretty complicated. And I've got some things in here to show you when I light things and do things at night. So a lot of our time is going to be, now we're going to kind of drift into looking at some imagery. I'm going to let you watch it, and then we'll kind of talk about what it took to create that time lapse and what thoughts are involved so that when you go out, again, you can kind of make use of, of my experience. So when I'm traveling and I've got a long layover, I find myself a window, put a camera in it, two second interval. Let me see what serendipity will happen in front of my lens. You know, in this case, it was an international flight that they were loading. So lots of containers. And you'll see this, the clouds are very gently moving by. There's more activity down below. So I'm just in, I have to include some of the sky, but I didn't need to include anything below uh, the machines right in front as they bring up the different elements that are going to be loaded onto the plane. So the white balance is consistent, two second interval. Everything's focused, the tripod's locked down. I'm enjoying a cocktail while well, this is this is probably two hours that I'm capturing the files in order to create this, I believe it's about a one minute time lapse. Through a it's through a window, yeah. I wish I could say that as, you know, as tourists or people going through that you can step outside and enjoy no distortion, but you know, with that I want to make sure that I get my lens right up against the window so there's no reflections or anything. But once that plane was backed out and gone, so was my time lapse because now I no longer have a subject. All right, so we kind of have to be lucky that there's a plane in the gate. It's a continual time versus what's in front of me. Where do I sit? Um, while we're talking about windows, something that you may want to pick up, it's called a lens skirt. You know, if you ever shoot through windows, we have reflections. I'm looking at the screen and I can see a lot of reflections, a high gloss screen. Windows are certainly that way, and dependent upon the time of day, it becomes more apparent or less apparent. But what a lens skirt is, it's a velvet square with a round opening that's going to cinch down over your lens. That velvet, you can, it's got su four suction cups that you would just suction cup it to the window. Now it's provided you no reflections. It weighs virtually nothing. I'm sure they carry it here at B&H. It's a beautiful tool to keep in your camera bag, even just for still photographs. But for time lapse, it's invaluable. So. Traffic increased, right? We've, we've got, uh, it, it's in China, first off, a, a remarkable find in, in terms of this bridge. I saw that somebody else had photographed it once. Where in 
This is in Shanghai. So kind of a funny thing. You know, we've got so many tools to our advantage. And I don't know if you make use of Google Earth, but Google Earth is powerful. If you want to find something and where you should go before you've ever gotten there, you can see the buildings that are around there. And you know, China just has a ton of growth. And I was in Shanghai the year before that. So now, depending upon when the Google Earth images were captured, I had picked out the building that I was going to go try to gain access to. When I got there, the buildings were gone. Those little buildings had become three giant high-rises that they were about 40% done building. And just funny stories. There's always a story to go with most of our images. And if you're a photographer, you know that. Um, in the US, we couldn't get into a construction zone. Right? Liability, you'd have to have a hard hat, all the different things that you'd have to sign off to. In China, we walked in. We ended up going over to one of the operators of the outside uh, elevator that brings you up. In this case, it only brought us up to the 20th floor of 34 floors. And I wanted to be on the top looking down over this bridge. So she was very kind and brought us up to the 20th floor, which is a few feet away from the building. So now with a camera back on your back, you're kind of swinging across some, uh, what is, what's the stuff that goes on the outside of the building? Scaffolding. scaffolding. Thank you. I couldn't think of scaffolding, but kind of had a rocket across and land inside the building. And I'm always saying, in the US, I could never make this. And, Got over to the edge, found the spot, and that beautiful winding ramp. You know, it's, it's always finding a great subject. So doing your research, getting there early enough, figuring out how to gain access, finally making access, but being in control of what you're doing. Because I showed up there, by the time I was able to get there, figure out how to get up, get over to the side of the building that I needed, it was time to begin the exposure. Because as you saw, it went from day to night. It's a pretty complex way of, of having to make a time lapse because light changes 20 f-stops in the time that you saw that. So there's ways within this LR time lapse program, it's called the Holy Grail, that it will help adjust the images or the exposure inside your images to what you saw there. You didn't see any exposure change at all. And that's, that's a key element. But starting off, I thought with, which is something, 10 seconds, I got my 300 images. It was, it was pretty consistent. So looking for subject matter, now that becomes the really difficult part. You can learn the technique as hopefully you just did. You have your notes, have it with you, create a little cheat sheet that you can have in your camera bag. I do that with a lot of things, laminated so it'll be there. And then when you get out there, you have your notes in front of you. But let's look at a couple more examples. This I'll talk through because I don't have any sound to it. You know, as a still photographer, when you get out and you're going to photograph a sunrise, hopefully you're there one hour before the sun rises, which is generally in pitch black dark. I like one hour because I can get my camera set up, and all of a sudden I start to see a glow on the horizon, and I know that that's where the sun is going to be coming up. If you don't have Sunseeker or Photographer's Ephemeris, there's so many tools to get us there. But just like with that saguaro cactus before, you'll see I've chosen a Joshua tree, this is in Joshua Tree National Park, to be my strong anchor in the center and let everything go around that. So starting off when it's absolute dark, having the correct exposure for it, figuring out where I'm going to be going for when the sun comes up, as you saw it kind of climb through and God was real good to me, put some, some clouds right there. So it would cut the density down. And I decided to complete the time lapse when the sun came clear of that, because now it's a giant flare. But camera steady, focus is on, everything is what we need to be. We just have to hope that the weather or our vision of what our subject matter is has continued all the way through that time period that we're looking to collect at least those 300 images. Let's, this is something I just shot, this is about six weeks ago. I shot this with the Canon 5D Mark IV. 
Now, I'm going to get into a little bit of motion control, of which I've got some slides that I'll show you in a few minutes for you to see how it's done. But I love movement in, in still photographs. So I think I opened the shutter. This is about midnight. And not only did I just do that hour and a half of the camera sliding back, starting, you know, looking through the window. That's first. When I'm looking for cactus, I love, I call them droopy arms, or in this case, I've, I've named this cactus Buddha. He's, he's got these big crossed arms that I fell in love with one day when I was out photographing. I had first gotten the camera, and I went out to explore some new areas to find some new subject matter. And I found Buddha, and I went, this is magnificent. I can photograph this cactus vertically, horizontally. It was during the day. I can go back at night because I can see through it. Right? It gives me a frame. It gives me a sense of depth and dimension. And that's truly what I'm looking to create in all of my imagery, still imagery or moving. I want to see, be able to see multiple layers because you're entertained. And what I did is I captured that 300 exposure time lapse. I just had it on a slider that was moving after each image. It's a shoot, move situation, shoot, move, shoot. So the camera will make an exposure. It'll move, steady, take the next exposure, move. And I just combined two techniques here where I did that until it got right to the top. And then I decided I was going to add a star trail to it. And I switched from 30 second exposures to four minute exposures. Because now with Star Trail, like what you're looking at, cumulatively, that's an hour and a half exposure. But we really can't do an hour and a half exposure on a digital body. That length of exposure builds a lot of heat on the sensor. And building heat on the sensor, the byproduct is noise. And we've got a ton of noise, noise that is hard to get rid of. So there are a number of people, I don't recall where it first came from, after two nights in a row losing 300 images that I had done in Monument Valley because the battery ran out when I, uh, when I enabled in-camera noise reduction. Because we have that. One of the, the cool things, you know, is all, if, I hope you go through your camera and understand the things that are in there and the custom functions. But I can go in and I can apply noise reduction when it's high ISO. So if I'm shooting something at 50,000 or 100,000 ISO, I'm going to let the camera work for me to get rid of some of that noise. And for long exposure noise reduction, it's a different algorithm. So we can enable long, long exposure noise reduction to get rid of noise. But I found once I was going to 30, uh, to an hour and a half exposure, what the camera actually does is takes a second image inside at the same length of exposure that you just took. So if I took a 90 minute time lapse, 90 minutes, the camera's going to process the next image. And the battery comes up about 252, 2 hours and 57 minutes. So it just has us miss it. So the recipe that I, I work with now to do star trails, it's a kind of simple one to remember. I do four minute exposure. My aperture is at f4. My ISO is at 400 ISO. And we go back to that intervalometer that I was talking about, the hanging intervalometer. I'm going to make sure that in between each of these four minutes at f4 and 400 ISO, I've got a one second interval. If you have a two second interval, you're going to have dotted lines in the sky. The one second interval seems to work. So I'll then take, just stepping off time lapse and talking about star trails, I'll take those 24 or so exposures. I'll do my correction on the first one, synchronize it with the other 23. I'll output those 24 exposures to, fa to Facebook, to Photoshop. And I'll enter them all as layers. So it's a very simple thing to do. Open all those images as layers in Photoshop. 
once it loads all of those 24 layers into Photoshop, I just go to the blending mode and change it to lighten. And it goes from seeing a slight little streak to seeing the full circle of stars that you've built. So it's kind of nice and easy. And I thought, well, then how can I show that in a video here? How can I do that in a time lapse and combine those two elements? So kind of once you do anything once, you start tripping and saying, well, how can I improve this? And that, to me, is a mantra to share with you that anything I take, any image I'm doing, if it's still video, no matter what, I'm going to review it after I take that photograph. And what goes through my mind is, how can I improve this photograph? You know, sometimes we'll look and find a garbage can or something that's annoying that we didn't consider in the original composition. But whatever it be, if I'm totally content with it, then I'm content with it. I can move on to another image. I don't need to stay there and do more imagery. Another kind of simple, brief time lapse. A little bit of motion there. There are a number of accessories that we can add just to your, to your tripod head. I work with a really right stuff tripod. Their BH55 head, ball head 55, it handles a big camera. Because the cameras that I'm normally photographing with are either the 5D Mark IV, up until recently the 5D Mark III, and I'm a 1D series user, a 1DX Mark II in this case now. So it's some substantial weight, and if you're mounting that with a, I guess my favorite landscape lens is a 28 to 300 millimeter L lens that's image stabilized. It's a little heavier than the 70 to 200, but it's, it's a magnificent lens that I don't have to change lenses. You know, if I came in, coming in today, I just came in with a backpack. I could have my 1DX and that 28 to 300, and I can photograph wide to long without having to open up to let dust in. So most people don't know about the lens. It's magnificent. But the idea of, OK, everything's stacked on the tripod. We've weighted it down. Now I have a couple of accessories that I'm able to use, and one of them being um, a little mini, ooh, where'd my brain go? A mini syrup. Syrup is a, a little motion control, S-Y-R-P, a motion control rotator, if you would. There are small ones. It's about the size of a hockey puck. And what I can do is mount that on top of my ball head, and that's just going to rotate the camera. It'll be on the same plane. I can't change the plane, but that's what I used here. It's, a, it's an, an inclusive battery, so I just make sure it's charged. There's a cord that connects to your three-prong remote cord, you know, where you plug in your cable release. And the tri it, it's controlled absolutely from your smartphone or from an iPad. So you can pick how much of a degree. Do I want a 30-degree turn? How long do I want that to take? Hit start, and we're all set. So we're going to start talking about incorporating motion into this. Because it's really nice. You know, the camera is still, and things are moving in front of it. But like you saw with this, why not move with the Milky Way? We can figure out how long it'll take to get there. We have a couple of apps on our phones to do that. So if we can measure at what point it'll be where, it's easy enough to set a timer to get us over there. Up in Nebraska, I'm out storm chasing. I, I, I do a wide variety of uh, extreme photographic events. I, I photograph tornadoes. I live in Phoenix, so I tend to photograph monsoon, which gives us either you know, rolling dust, haboobs. I can play it again for you, sure. Uh, so I, I'm photographing a wide variety of things. And when there's no weather, we've got to rely on, on something else. And in my case, especially summertime, I'm usually in the plain states between May and June. 
That's kind of when the tornadoes come up from Oklahoma and they work their way across our country up to the northern border. And I had the hardest time finding trees, finding something to, to create as a foreground. So when all else fails, I find a pond. I've got some reflective activity, so it it's becomes its own foreground. But all I'm doing, you'll see that it's early in the season, so the Milky Way is kind of low, and it just transitions. The earlier in the season, let's look at the Milky Way as an April 15th to September 15th visitor here in the Northern Hemisphere. Once September 15th happens, the Milky Way kind of goes down into the Southern Hemisphere, and we have nothing to photograph until it comes back. But I tend to make a lot of exposures during that time that in April, when it first comes over the horizon, the Milky Way is almost horizontal. It's almost laying down. So as it comes over the horizon, it'll then stand up and transition through your photographs. Later in the season, September, by the time it gets dark, it's already standing up. We just watch it transition a little bit more toward the southwest now. Normally it's anchored. The bottom of the Milky Way is often anchored in the southern sky. And it'll stretch from the southern sky clear across to almost due north. So when I'm outside, I tend to create tie, uh, panoramas. I can create a 9 or an 11 frame panorama, 180 degrees. So we can see the arc of that Milky Way, but that's not really a time lapse situation. One of my favorite things to have to go out and find places to photograph. In this case, this is Iceland. Now, I, I chase the aurora. I just should have stayed with the system I was using. Um, I chase the aurora through Norway, Iceland, Alaska, northern Canada. And I'm lucky enough to find it here in the US. There was a forecast that last night was going to be a stupidly strong G3, which is one of the strongest geomagnetic storms that I thought we could see it from here. And I was out on Long Island, so I was all ready to go out. And as with any kind of weather phenomena, it changed. It just it kind of faded as the night went on that I wasn't able to actually waste the time to go out and sit in the wind and the cold because it probably wasn't visible from here. But this is a two second interval, and you'll see some things moving slowly, but there's that stutter in it. It, it always does something unique. So sometimes, and I'll show you another time lapse in a minute, where it's just beautifully soft and smooth. But you never know what you're going to get. And this is in the northern part of Iceland, a really magnificent place. It's often very clear. My foregrounds are just these old uh, volcanic remnants, since the island is primarily volcanic. But if you haven't traveled to Iceland yet, put it on the top of your list. Uh, remembering that, kind of like the Milky Way, so the Milky Way is available April 15th to September 15th. Guess what dates the aurora season is? Coincidentally, the same, April 15th to September 15th, because we've got uh, midnight sun to contend with. And usually April 15th is about the end of, of having nighttime up in the northern latitudes. So you wouldn't really want to go to Iceland in July hoping to see the aurora. It's not going to happen because it doesn't get dark. And September 15th is usually when dark returns to those latitudes. <laughs>
always something to help you spend your money here at B&H. <laughs> but with that said, let's just take a quick peek at some different elements. If I'm working with a slider, where you've seen the camera move, where it comes up and moves to another position, I'm working in this case with a dynamic perception slider, a stage zero or a stage one. This is the stage zero where it's a six foot aluminum rail. There's a little control as part of that that you can program in what you're doing. But as you can see by my two Bogan tripods here, I know I'm working out of my car and I'm, I've driven to this location rather than flown because carbon fiber flies. These kind of tripods stay home. But I need something to support the top and bottom. And in getting there, I'm gonna set up the six foot track I'm going to establish, when I pick that spot, I'm going to establish a beginning point that's an impressive photograph. Right? When you see something, you want to be locked into it. So I want to make sure that I've got a good foreground, I've got good elements working for me. And as this camera moves and transitions to the top or bottom, whatever direction we're going in, when it gets to someplace six foot later, I also need to have a strong image there. So if it's framed with something else, it takes a little bit of coordination to do this. We're setting something up like this. It could take me an hour to get right. Because you've got to move the camera from one end to the other, make sure it's level, make sure your exposure's set, all the different things that we've spoken about. But it adds that degree of difficulty or interest to it. And to me, that's a really important part. So I'm in Monument Valley. This is Left Mitten, in case you haven't met it before. And you'll see I've got two, two um, time lapses going on here simultaneously. The bottom one is a slider. And you can see it's in the middle of making an exposure of left mitten. The top one here, looking in a different direction, this probably has a 24 to 105 on it. This one has a 16 to 35. So it's just taking that second angle where I'm kind of going be below ground here, making either a reveal or making something disappear. So we can use a lot of cinematic technique in your understanding of uh, motion control and time lapse to add that interest that you know, we want to make something really interesting to the viewer. So this one's, the slider is being run on the controller that's part of the slider. I've programmed everything in, the interval, the exposure, how much movement it's going to be. And then I have a stationary one here where you see the intervalometer is hanging from it that at any point, as I shared with you before, I can stop it, check the frame, keep going without a glitch in it, but I can make sure that I'm on target. So, is this for the lazy photographer? Eh, not really. Right? You may develop some friends that can help carry this for you, but bottom line, I think we're loners, and especially when you get into time lapse. Your friends, your husband, your wife, Nobody understands that you're going to be taking one picture for an hour and a half. Right? And it's always at the best time of day, be it sunrise or, or twilight. Right? And I'm hungry and I'm tired and I'm cold and all those things take away from what you're doing. So the best thing I can suggest is leave everybody at home. <laughs> leave yourself enough time to bring things out, set it up, get it set. I bring two things that aren't in my camera bag that I think are really, really important. I take a chair, and I take a cooler, right? Because if I'm comfortable, I can stay there all night. And that's what I tend to do, especially in Arizona. When I go out, when I got that Mark IV, and I, had, I only had three weeks to play with it, so I wanted to create everything that I could. I was out four or five nights in a row doing overnight time lapses. And I got to tell you, you get a little nervous when cars drive by, and you know, you know you've got some equipment there, and if you're parked in the same spot three or four nights, you, you just need to have situational awareness like we talked about earlier. But ultimately, we're going to make images at the best light of day. So it's a real pain in the neck. This is sunrise in Monument Valley, getting in there an hour and a half or so before because I need to set everything up and then be ready for when light cracks that horizon, or kind of the, the other side of the coin, this is taken in, yellow, in uh, Yosemite. 
So if you can imagine Yosemite, Yosemite is a zoo day or night. And one of the things I love is Valley View. If you've been to Yosemite before, Valley View is a, a beautiful look down the valley where you see El Capitan right in front of you. There's a river there, so we've got a nice reflection. And I found this beautiful log. Now, my tripods are extended to the top. I very rarely use my center column because that's kind of the weak link in a tripod. But I had to get this to six feet over this log. But it gave me this perspective. This is just one frame from this time lapse. So this is taken about midnight. I think I opened my shutter here at midnight and went to 2.30 in the morning, capturing this 10 second clip. But I wanted that, that log in the foreground. It gave me a really good, strong foreground, and especially that the slider is walking along it. So we get to see that movement all the way through. And this, you know, it's the moonlight hitting there. So I'm still standing in, in for the most part, darkness. And one of the great things when you're out and doing time lapse, your other senses really become awakened. If you can imagine at 2.30 in the morning, you're standing there and you can't see much, but yet all of a sudden, you feel this cool moisture just hit you. And you're like, what is that? Until you realize when you look at your frames, look, it was fog. You could see it come right across the water and, and at you. So one of the great things about being outside where you're not concentrating on continually looking for one image, but you're making this image through the series, is that you're really in touch with what's going on out there. And you can really enjoy nature. Let's go into some nighttime movement in Monument Valley. I'm going to let you see this, and then we'll talk about what went into this. this is pretty complex and this is this time lapse was created in the winter time if, if I remember correctly it's around New Year's I love that week between Christmas and New Year's to get away I see my family I see my friends and then for New Year's I tend to go away and it's it's very retrospective for me because I kind of look at last year what went on what do I want to do for this year just get in touch with things and I relax photographically. As much as I, I've been a photographer for 43 years, uh, with one exception, early before I got into photography, that's the only job I know. And I'm, I'm only telling you that because of this next part, my hobby is photography. So when I'm not working, I'm playing. But it's still photographic. So the time lapse you're going to see, we'll, again, we'll discuss all the elements that are there and how you come up with these ideas. But this all took place in one night. So total is about seven or eight hours of time lapse to get to the minute that you're going to look at. I'll show you or I'll discuss with you as soon as we get back. So, kind of complicated. We'll start at the beginning. I'm, I'm going to shut the sound off for a second just so I can walk you through parts of it. Because if I were looking at that and I didn't know what I knew, the first question would be, how did you do that? Right? Kind of a magician thing. Not thinking that this is magic, but uh, let me silence it first. 
So when you first saw anything, as it sort of fades in, I began my exposure before the moon ever got anywhere near the horizon. So you can just see the silhouette of the, I think this is the most sensuous tree I've, I've found yet. Good friend of mine in Monument Valley. But I started it basing the, the exposure upon what I knew the moonlight exposure to be. So for the first half hour, I'm grossly underexposing my frame. But what you saw is, as the, as the moon came close to the horizon, what it does before it illuminates anything on Earth, it changes the, the lightness of the sky, if you would, which is why when there's a moon around, we can't see the Milky Way. So it took that sky from just black, and it started becoming kind of dark blue, light blue, and all of a sudden it had a presence. It gave me a silhouette of the tree up there. And then counting on that moon now climbing over the horizon, it starts to illuminate the Earth. So when you saw the tree just suddenly get bathed in moonlight, boom, there's my exposure. That, that was correct exposure that I set at the beginning because I'd been photographing outdoors at night. From there, I took my position and I moved inside that tree. So let's just let it do that, that once it gets there, see if we can't help it along. And all the time you can see the stars turning. I'm looking north, so everything is circling kind of around Polaris, which is the North Star. But what I did here now is I move into this tree. I took my six-foot slider, and this is with a 14-millimeter lens. I took the six-foot slider and put it into this tree that was no taller than this. It doesn't even exist anymore, sadly. I went back, I go back to Monument Valley usually two or three times a year, and somebody must have hung on it, and the tree is now broken into pieces. But I created this beautiful frame, as you see, so I wanted to make sure that I could capture that frame. So I started in close and had that thing work itself back to this point where I was going to actually stop the video, right? Stop its motion, stop its movement, because I climbed up from you just seeing the mitten up to and including that circle. So it took an hour and a half for it to climb, and my exposure was 30 seconds at, I'm going to imagine in this case it was about 5.6 or 6.3 or at 100 ISO as it's climbing. So I've got plenty of time for it to move, and it's a 14 millimeter lens. So I'm going to share just a couple of things with you about photographing at night that you can apply to still photographs as well as motion like this. There's sort of a rule, and it's called the rule of 500 where you determine what's the longest exposure that I can use without getting the stars moving. Because, and we may already be drifting into the longer exposure, but we want to make sure that those stars are pinpoint light sources. So if you're working with a 50 millimeter lens and you divide that 50 millimeter into 500, you come up with 10 seconds. So if you're working with a 50 millimeter one two, the longest exposure that you can use when you're photographing outside at night with the stars in the photograph would be 10 seconds. With a 14 millimeter lens, divide 14 into 500, I believe you come up to 28 point something or 29.6 seconds, a 30 second exposure. So the wider the lens, the longer exposure I can use. The longer the lens, which has a narrower field of view and there's magnification involved, requires a shorter exposure. But I did this climb because I, I just love that appearance of, of the, the circle appearing. And then once we got to the top, I shifted over from the 30 second exposure to that four minute recipe that I gave you for creating a star trail. So I didn't move anything, made sure the camera was rock steady, just changed really quickly my ISO, my shutter speed, and my aperture started another hour and a half exposure. So when we were watching the moon climb up, that was an hour and a half. When we did this pull to this point, that was an hour and a half. 
Now that I'm doing the star trail, that's an hour and a half. And as I go on to the next little part, once it creates this and we start to slide down the tree, now I've taken the camera out of the tree and I've changed the angle of the slider so that it's going across. So what I knew I wanted to do is like you see here. I wanted to frame these three buttes back here with the tree. So I've kind of figured out how to make this an interesting photograph from coming out of it to going down. So we're looking at a 20 second clip that took six or seven or eight hours to make. But to me, the nice part of doing all this is you're all sleeping, right? We didn't see one car go through here. It's so peaceful, it's, it's so nice. But at the same time, just a quick story. I was up photographing the Aurora in Spokane, just out of Spokane, Washington, a place that I had found last summer solstice. I, I continually watch a number of weather forecasts, and one of them is the Aurora Borealis forecast. And last June 20, 21st, there was a wicked, a wicked forecast that would bring the Aurora into being visible in the U.S. So I flew up to Seattle, drove across to Spokane, and found a foreground. That's a mouthful. The flying is easy, every, the drive is easy, but where do you stop? And I had found this abandoned farm. And as luck has it, when I pulled up, the car behind us, we're in the middle of farm country. There's no f cars out at, at night. And there was a car out, and he, and he must have seen us pull up into this driveway. And the guy came up and said, what are you doing? So first question I asked, are you the, the landowner? And he says, yeah, why? I said, well, you know, we just saw this from the road. I'm a photographer. The Aurora is going to be out tonight. Is it all right if we go in and, and make some exposures? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So finding a place is just remarkable. So I had permission to use it, created remarkable photographs. Um, went back this year. This year it was June 4th, another one of those spectacular forecasts. Flew to Seattle. Drove to now, I knew where the farm was, went right to it. Get there, and now I started a couple of different time lapses. I've got one right in front of me with a tree and this old farm, 14 millimeter. Found another tree over to the side, set a second camera going over there. And about two hours into it, I hear something rustling in the, in the brush, because it's the old tall grass, and, and I'm getting nervous now. You know, what is it? and I can hear it breathing. And I thought, I don't care if it's a mouse, it's a bear. You know, your, your mind just gets the best of you. And, and I can't put the lights on, because the second I put my flashlight on, I've ruined my exposure. So I yell out, I still hear it there, and finally I go, I gotta do it. Put my flashlight on, and, and there's this deer standing 10 feet from me. And I thought, as soon as I put the light on, he's gone. And he would move. And I'm flashing and uh, doing all stupid human things. And he's just looking, going, I just want some company. I mean, it's nighttime. And he stayed with me for that night. So it's, it's just kind of cool, but you know, you scare yourself. But it's just being aware and, and feeling and seeing everything. But being outside is just remarkable at night. If you haven't done it, you need to. So. That's going to kind of segue me into this next compilation of, of desert capture, which you're, I think as photographers, we're all searching for subject matter. right? We don't want to go find Ansel Adams tripod holes or my idol David Munch. There's been photographers forever creating spectacular landscapes, but you need to make it your own. So one of the things that I, I find that we have that's unique in, in the Arizona desert, we have saguaro cactus. And once a year, less for 24 hours, they blossom. And they're spectacular. They blossom at night. So I, I called down to the national park that we have, saguaro national park, and I requested permission to spend a couple of nights there. 
And normally in a national park, you don't have to do that, right? They're open, and but there are some in sort of drug running, people running areas that it's kind of dangerous for. And I recognize what goes on in the Arizona desert because we're lucky enough to be able to carry protection. But national parks, you can't bring guns into. But I, I, still, you try to do the system the right way. And I, I called the ranger there and explained who I was and give any information so they can do a background check that this is what I'm looking to do. And I said, I want to I wanna see saguaro blossoms. I want to be able to photograph them opening. When do they open? He said, I don't know. But it's like when people ask about the aurora. What time does the aurora get on? You know, there is no time. What I found out with the saguaro blossoms, it's about 10 o'clock where they begin their opening. So I spent two nights the first year down photographing these saguaro blossoms and, and opening. We're going to be looking at a 2 minute and 38, two, yeah, 2 minute 38 second film in a second. I went back and I subsequently learned how to do this. That the first time you do it, you can't know everything that goes on. So I went and I photographed them and this will end up being, I believe I used five different cameras and tripods to collect this. But it's, it's finding the ones that are even going to open because they're all plump. It's kind of watching a nine month pregnant woman, right? She looks like she's ready to give birth, but will it be today or next week or next month? Well, seeing these blossoms, you kind of have to be in the right place at the right time, and you're taking a chance on it. And that's to me what photography is. We take a chance. If it's not a risk, then anybody could do it, and everybody does do it, and it's not interesting. But I was outside the first year. I think I'm, what I'm showing you is the second year first. The first year that I found it, I could use the moon to illuminate these magnificent blossoms opening because the, the blooms were facing to the east where the moon's going to come up. For whatever reason, the second year, all the blossoms were on the west side of the cactus. That presents a little bit of a problem. When the moon comes up, nothing is lighting your foreground. So now I had to bring light out in order to illuminate the area and make it look somewhat real. So that's what you're going to see here is that I'm outside, I'm doing some B-roll, I'm I'm getting there for sunset so I can, I don't just get into close to a flower and it opens, right? You kind of have to lead in. Like with anything in motion, there's the opening or the establishment, there's the meat of the program, and then the closing. So that's what you're going to see. I'm not going to talk to you through this, I'm just going to let you enjoy it.
just understanding your subject, learning about it, seeing where things are going to happen. Most of what you saw there was captured on a 14 millimeter lens. So especially the close ones. I was only three, four feet away from what's going on. So holding focus is kind of a challenge when you're shooting at 2.8. So my ISO is up there. The shutter speed is up there. When you saw the blossom begin to open and go through to completion, the ones that were close at the end, that's four hours. So it's just, it's being married to the concept, it's being married to the, the commitment of capturing this. And it's so interesting to watch, again, the rest of nature sitting in a chair, like those last ones I had a light, similar to what we have here in the event space today, a light into a little soft box, because I need soft, direct, soft directional, but not too directional light, because I've got different cameras going. Well, with enough illumination that way, I'm sitting right next to the cactus, right next to my camera. Because when you're doing long time lapses like this, a four hour time lapse, you, you want to make sure that the shutter keeps going, that you don't lose it at a certain point, that it stops for whatever the reason. You can still catch up with it, right, if I have to change batteries or what have you. But one of the great things was watching the trail of ants. Now, this is all succulent juices coming out of the saguaro. So I'd watch the trail of ants that would go from ground level, climb up this cactus, go out on the arm, come all the way around. I mean, they had some journey. You know, but at two, three, four o'clock in the morning, you're still entertaining yourself because you know that you need to be there for the completion and just watch this thing totally power back, where if I came back the next night, that thing will be shriveled. If I come back the next day, it'll be on the ground. So it's a very, very short period of, of its life cycle, but it's understanding the life cycle. And I think you, you set out a goal, and as complicated as that is, that, that's what we're growing toward. And that's why I've kind of put things in the sequence that I've shared with you today. Just something simple where you can go play at the state fair, or you can find a tree out there and, and watch the stars turn or the Milky Way move, up to more complex situations. And I've got a few more for you. So it's funny, you know, those at home, you're live streaming. You probably got up, you went to the bathroom, you've done a few things, you got something to drink. My poor people here in the audience, I know they're dying for a bathroom break. But a couple more things, and, uh, and we'll be close to the end here. So in Yosemite, the moon has risen. We can just see why what's going on here. This is Yosemite Falls. And all of a sudden, you're going to see the light change because the, the falls are going to become illuminated, and the black trees that are in the foreground are going to become illuminated, and you're going to see fog build. There'll be a little soft focus to this for a little bit. You know, the little flare, not, not as good as being in the desert alone. Yosemite people don't sleep. But how neat to watch. You can see the stars circling. So I'm looking almost due north. I can tell by the stars that I could, do, I could have done a star trail right behind here. That's fog coming across. You see the reveal of the moon. And now the moon is behind me. So like every minute? Every minutes. The, the exposure here, it's a 30 second exposure with a two second interval. So I don't want it to go too long, because then the thing will be moving really rapidly in front of the lens. And then for some fun, it's a little compilation in Phoenix, in the desert. There are those days, you know, as photographers, we need to have technique. We need to build knowledge like you're doing today. And then you need luck, right? You're going to think of going out, and why today? Why today am I driving to this one spot? This was one of those lucky days for me when I went out. I, I, what you're going to see a lot of this is black and white, which is a convert, an infrared converted 5D Mark II in this case, um, that through a lot of monsoon season to get that texture in the clouds, I just love infrared. 
I love that strong black and white. So I've got a camera converted. I can certainly use that for time lapse. And what I did in this situation that you're going to see, I, I went to an area that I wanted to photograph because I saw that later on in the day, storms were going to build. So when I first got there, there was nothing going on. There weren't any clouds in the sky. And we're going to pick it up from when the clouds started to arrive that I had two storms coming at me, one from the north, one from the south. And strangely, as life happens, they met in the middle, right in front of me. So it was this wonderful thing that this turned into the most magnificent display of lightning. That this was probably the first time that when I was photographing lightning, I jumped in the car. <laughs> you know, there are times you know you need to be off the ground and that you might be beyond your comfort zone. And, and I photograph a lot of lightning. But periodically, when, when the lightning strikes and the thunder is simultaneous and you know the storm is right above you, yeah, I want to be my feet off the ground. But enjoy this. I love black and white. When I started doing motion, why not do it in black and white as well? So it worked together with storms and rolling clouds, and, and I can't tell you why I put that sun setting behind the, uh, the city of San Francisco taken with an 800 millimeter from, oh, I forget how far away I was, um, over in Oakland actually shooting across the bay. But ultimately, you know, there were so many things here, being up in the uh, Marin Headlands, you know, be climbing up to Mount Temple Pilus, if the type of to Mount Tam, over in that, that same redwood area where you can just see the fog rolling over the trees, that blanket coming through. But as much as all of these things that I create and I hope all of my, my peers and colleagues create, we have a respect for the land. Right? We have a respect for the subject matter that regardless of what it is, you find a path. I know when I go to Death Valley, it hurts me when I walk on the salt of Devil's Golf Course. 
because I'm changing it, right? We, we need to be out there, but you don't need to be stepping on things. And it goes down to even having the beauty of, uh, of the sand dunes, mesquite sand dunes in Death Valley. And if you've ever gone out with friends, the hardest thing in the world is having a friend alongside you when you're photographing because they're bored while they're talking to you and you're creating images and all of a sudden they want to walk into your frame or, or mark the, the dunes and that's not going to fix until tomorrow, maybe the next day. But the things that have been going on lately, you know, the disrespect for land and, and while we're in Death Valley, the most recent thing that I heard was out on the playa at the racetrack in Death Valley. Some people who, I, I don't know where this comes from, but there's always something new in, in a, an upcoming generation. People drove out onto the playa. It's all blocked that you can't get out there. And they went out and they made donuts and they tore up the playa. Now, that may not be fixed in our lifetime. You know, and I'm, I'm sure you saw the, the baboon that was wearing a, a Boy Scout uniform and under the guise of protecting other people who were going to walk through that knocked down those, those boulders or the one in Oregon recently. You know, we have to protect the land. And I'll, I'll tell you this, I was out in, um, in Yellowstone going to see Grand Prismatic. Grand Prismatic, if you haven't been there, the most colorful thing that we have. I love the open earth. I'm going to show you something in a few minutes of, of lava at, uh, on the Big Island, looking into the, the um, the lava lake. But when we see and we have all these things, and there are signs everywhere, don't touch the pad, like you know, these, these algae formations in, in Yellowstone. And I see this woman walking up with her two-year-old son, and the kid's got a stick, and he's stabbing it as he's walking up. And, and I'm forward, I, ma'am, you see the signs? Leave him alone, he's just a boy. Really? He's marking it for life, where the people that we saw walk out there this year. You know, it's up to us to protect that as well. You're not going to get into an argument with people. You photograph them, and you make sure you photograph them getting back into their car. Because I've had discussions with rangers, and there's nothing that we can do to get in there. We can't create a fight or any kind of problem, but we can report them, and they take it seriously. If it's weeks later, they'll track down who these people were. So help us keep the Earth the way that we have it for generations to come. But what you saw here is storms, storms coming, taking over, right? Having a strong photograph, there was a part of the Arizona portion of that where you saw that storm come in and it get really wicked dark and then just the sun peeked out at the end. While that time lapse was running, I was shooting color. So I had two or three other cameras going of which when you check into Canon's, uh, if you check into the Explorer of Light page or even Canon's homepage for the month of October. I'm lucky enough to be up there again. I just got back from Albuquerque, the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta. So some of my images with the 5D Mark IV are heading the homepage. Um, and you'll see there's a couple of very unique images up there, but I'm, I'm really blessed to be able to do these things and test new cameras, come up with new imagery, and Canon uses a lot of my imagery. So you can see these things like uh, our printer division has, has used from that same shoot of that storm, just a magnificent rainbow over that area where the bottom is lit warm and magnificently and the top is cold blue with all the clouds that were there. So there, there's so many statements that we make and so many byproducts that because you're out there, and like in this case, I'm hopefully arming you to do a, a wonderful job with creating time lapses, we still have still photographs that keep us going. You can be doing video clips, you can be doing so much more aside from keeping the earth the best that we can make it. I want to make sure to be able to show you a couple more things. So I'm just going to move forward a little bit. And in fact, I'm going to go with this one next. Kind of nice starting point when you consider what we're doing, what we're looking to create. Here's a harbor in Seattle. And I just, I loved it. it, was an infrared day. Found this one boat in front of me. And kind of to that point of watching clouds build and, or be born, be born and dissipate. 
a very simple time lapse, but knowing the clouds are moving into my frame, you know, hoping for that mirror reflection up until another boat will come through it and ruin it. Things we can't tell, but I've, I've got the anchors here. I just want to establish that. I've got my movement in the clouds. I have that boat in the foreground, and as soon as the sun went behind a hill that they were going to, that God was vignetting for me, I got that dark area in the foreground. I knew it was time that I could cut. So a lot of times I'll read light like that so that I can make sure that I've got enough control that I, I don't want to manipulate the image, that I get in there and burn it or anything like that. I just let God take care of that job for me. Another kind of simple, beautiful thing that I couldn't imagine capturing this in a still photograph. So again, to me, that, that kind of gets beyond the idea of just something simple catching a still photograph. And I'm going to segue that into being in, in, again, what I consider where my heart lives in Monument Valley, you know, seeing fog move. It's not something we can do in a still photograph. Fog is ethereal. Fog is just, it's mysterious, right? It's just, it's something that I long for, especially I grew up here in New York. And 20 years ago, I moved out to Phoenix. So we go from seasons and humidity to Phoenix, right? We get 60 days of clouds, and the rest of it's just blue skies. And the one thing I never see anymore is fog. So I'm, I'm addicted to so many things. Uh, but this one, let me just share with you and set it up for you. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned I'm a hot air balloon pilot. And I got to be a hot air balloon pilot 25 years ago because I took a ride. And you're flying at sunrise or sunset. So you're elevated when the shadows are long. And it's like I knew from my first flight I need to do this myself. And I bought a balloon and found someone to teach me how to fly. And this time lapse comes from a balloon event. We were going to fly in Monument Valley. And we do this in December. Or we've done it the past few years. And this morning we got to Monument Valley. You could see fog in the distance in the dark. We're going to arrive at dark because we have to be ready around sunrise to lift off and have our flight while the winds are gentle. And this morning in particular, we, there are 25 balloonists there. And we've been, we, all, we always have a pilot briefing. We want to know what the weather is and what's going on, especially when it's an assembled group. So this day, while well, we're in the middle of the pilot briefing, and we all knew we weren't going to be flying because we saw some of the fog, and fog and visibility don't make for good landings. So we kind of knew we weren't going to fly, but somebody came into the briefing and said, hey, have you seen the sunrise out there? And 25 balloonists walked out, and 24 walked in. I ran to my car, and I got a tripod, my 5D3, set it up real quickly, and what I'm going to show you is about an hour and a half's worth of time.
I can't capture that feeling. And even when I pull stills from this, if I pulled six or eight frames, you'd see how it changed from that vibrant red and blue to a different frame, to a different color, to the blues, to the normal daylight. So I'm hoping that I've given you enough information that you can analyze what's in front of you. You can go out there and make that determination when you get out and put your camera on your tripod, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna capture what's appealing to me right now? And the conditions that we have and the place that we have and in the, uh, certainly in the weather that we have that day. All right, so playing. And I'll probably keep this to uh, the last one, and then I want to share just a couple little things. Why did you go behind? Something simple, we're often in Las Vegas. Canon had just released the 11 to 24. If you have not played with this lens and you're a Canon shooter, stop up here before you leave after this is over. It's the most magnificent lens. It's rectilinear, so as long as you keep it level, there's no distortion. And to have an 11 millimeter full frame lens is just spectacular. So, you know, yes, we have to modify our, our bag periodically to include a new body, but you know, we make these major investments in glass and that really defines our imagery. Right? The body is nice, it helps us capture things, but when you see beautiful imagery, But I think this whole concept of motion with still cameras is something that kind of takes us and transforms us now to another dimension. Because we're not just single photograph capturers, but we, we see things and we want to feel and we want to translate that to the people that we share our work with. And ultimately, isn't that the way we really grow and learn? That we learn from the people that we're inspired by and Please, God, hear me on this. We don't copy them, right? We use them for inspiration. I have people that I'm inspired by. I hope you do as well. That's how we grow. But we want to take that technique and apply it to our vision and make us better artists in our own right. That we don't want to go looking for tripod holes and we don't want to try to find what floor of the MGM Grand was I on to do the same thing, but incorporate that into your vision and make you a much better visual artist. So with that, let me post this one thing so you can all be in touch. Um, I've got, um, amongst many things, uh, I lead a lot of workshops and one that I'm really excited about, I'm doing my first safari in uh, 2018. But beyond that, I, I do a number of workshops for Canon. Uh, what we've got committed so far, I'll be leading a workshop at the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta next October in case you want to come play. Uh, something on the East Coast back in September. Uh, Linda, one of the guests here in the audience, was a, a participant in the Rockport workshop, a little fishing village in Rockport, Massachusetts that we go and have a ball in for three or four days. But on my website, which To the previous? Gladly. Uh, on my website, I list all of the workshops that I do. Uh, I photograph as well as lead workshops. And you can check Canon's uh, live learning, where Canon puts out a number of explorers each year. And we take you to our favorite places and show you how we create the images that we, we love so much. So for you to be in touch, 
my website, Serendipity Visuals. My email address, kensklude at me.com. Do not hesitate to be in contact if there's any questions that you have from today's presentation. If I can help you in even private mentoring, please let me know. But I'm here to, to help you get the images that I'm so lucky to create and see and hopefully help you see that as well. So thank you for joining me today. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.